everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Between Two Layers. I'm Carly Riley. Joining me today, of course, as always, Robbie Ferguson, president and co-founder at Immutable. Robbie, hello. What is up? Hey, Carly. Great to be here. Another good episode planned today. We're going to take you through the plan for today's episode. We have news up top. Robbie and I covering the latest and greatest in Web3 and gaming. We're going to have a game demo coming at you after that. We have the community spotlight from there. We're going to be hearing from you, answering your questions from the Immutable community. Then we'll have a round table where I'll sit down with Alex Connolly, co-founder and CTO at Immutable, to talk the Immutable ZK EVM passport and other good things. And then we'll get our final thought from Robbie himself. You ready? Let's do it. Let's dive in. Our first story today, we have the WebEx conference, which happened in Japan last week. Robbie, I know some of the team was over there. What have been the takeaways and insights? Yeah, so um, we, we've got a, a few boots on the ground in Japan and also uh, the majority of our, our partnerships team and our support team um, went over there. Honestly, the reaction from the team was the sentiment and the level of support and activity from Japan both from major multinationals and the government, plus games on the ground, is incredibly uh, bullish. Uh, we have literally the Japanese you know, prime minister, Fumio Kishida, saying Web3 is the new part of capitalism and this new basis for capitalism. Um, we have the, you know, the front cover of the Japan Times saying it's the US fumbling the bag and allowing Japan and Korea to enter here. Um, so we're really excited. Um, at the same time, last week we had uh, IMX become listed on Upbit, which is the major exchange in Korea. We're expanding our, our coverage there and talking to a ton of games. Um, and a lot of these in the background will will be announcing over the next few months as well. So um, we're, we're continuing to see really good tailwinds in, in these regions. We're, we're continuing to sort of scale up our presence in these regions. I'm very excited for what these genres of games in particular are going to bring to Web3 because they're so fundamentally driven by collectability in, in terms of you know gacha design or RPGs where collectability is at its core. One of the other hottest stories I really feel like in Web3, but broadly in tech this week and for the last couple of weeks has been WorldCoin. As people probably know, Sam Altman, co-founder of OpenAI, also co-founded a, a company called WorldCoin, which is trying to bring proof of personhood to the world. And they're doing it with these orbs that will scan your retina and prove you are a unique, identifiable human. Robbie, what do you make of the world coin news? Yes. So I think there are two ways to look at it. There's obviously the obvious dystopian commentary you can make, which is you literally have a you know giant corporation incentivizing people with digital currencies to scan their eyeballs. And it does sound bad. On the other hand, I think it's fascinating because... A, this is a genuine mission to create a decentralized global currency, and I think it's a noble initiative. Um, but B, it is the first time we've seen token-driven user acquisition, or essentially a vampire attack of real-life users. And we've seen uh, a token which very much, I think, the valuation is coming from um, you know, partially limited circulating supply and, and some sort of you know, funky stuff with market makers, but also just Sam Altman. Right, who's, who's probably in the top five figures in technology right now and, and the halo effect is bestowing on the project. And in exchange, what they're getting is, I think they've signed up now over 10 million users. Um, they have lines, if you saw the videos, into the street, all turning this you know, theoretical value of this collective future possible valuation into reifying that into real value. Because these people, as they're incentivized by this network, are actually creating the network's value. And I think this comes back to an original thesis that was part of the reason I, I fell in love with crypto in the first place, which is you can solve cold start problems and you can take massive networks and you can create a competing network much more efficiently by giving value away. As Jeff Bezos says, your margin is my opportunity and the ultimate margin by taking is equity and instead allowing these to be cooperatives owned by everyone. And I actually think that's incredibly cool but two, it's probably also the most powerful innovation in user acquisition or lead gen we've seen in the last three decades. Um, my thesis personally is games will start to adopt this. You'll have uh, a game which is very similar to an existing popular one, and it becomes successful just because it starts to share value. And the earliest adopters can obviously earn the most value because they're taking the most risk, solving what is referred to as this you know, cold start problem of any network-driven uh, product 
something like WorldCoin. Um, so I actually think it's really, really fascinating because it's the first time this is really broken out of just digital incentives where you have maybe a thousand whales who are switching liquidity between different you know, fruit themed DeFi protocols in order to maximize uh, liquidity or, or to maximize yield. And now you have this being millions and millions of people in the real world. Um, I think the obvious use case is let's go do this for gaming. We have one of the most powerful technologies and one of the most economically uh, sort of empowering technologies in, in terms of everyone can end up being an owner of this shared protocol and everyone is contributing to, to the collective success and is massively incentivized to do so. Um, so I actually think this is really, really interesting in terms of what this portends for UA and gaming. Does this also mean you will be getting your retina scanned? Um, I don't think they have one in Australia at the moment. Ah. Uh, I'm not sure personally whether I'd, I'd, I'd be scanning it, but um, I, I also don't have anything against those who, who are. Fair enough. I, I right. have one more orb overlords. <laughs> Uh, next on our news list, Activision Blizzard announced it will be laying off a number of staff members in their esports division. This comes simultaneously as we had some reporting out of, I believe, Cointelegraph quoting a number of popular pro gamers who were expressing a lot of interest in Web3. I'm wondering if you think there's this downfall happening a bit in traditional esports and if there's an opportunity there within Web3. Yeah, I, I'm not going to comment on the specific, obviously. Um, what this comes down to is fairness and economic value. Who is sharing things most fairly to the people creating value in ecosystems? And more and more, the people generating value in these ecosystems aren't just the games publishers themselves, it's the players, it's the streamers, it's the distributors who are now becoming huge uh, celebrities. You have XQC signing a $100 million contract with Kick. Why did he do this? Because Kick pays 95.5. They give 95% of the donations to the site. This is versus Twitch, which is 50-50, uh, or YouTube Gaming, which I think is slightly better than, excuse me, Twitch. And the inevitable trend of this is not just, well, how do you pay, give them a share of donations, but how do you actually give them a share of the underlying economic infrastructure in a way where you can't write them? Like that is the inexorable trend of this. And the answer to that is Web3. And it's not about the technology, it's just this is the trend and this is why people will ultimately want this. And we see, you know, hundreds of streamers or hundreds of successful esports players saying actually they do want this technology. You have Dr. Disrespect fundamentally believing in how this can be much better for players and gamers and streamers. And so I think the really interesting thing is what are we really building? We're building the infrastructure to allow players to truly own their digital assets and to have economic guarantees. Things like enforceable royalties, where if you're the one generating a, a line of you know, XQC skins, you can gain a percentage of sales in perpetuity, and the game can never take that away from you. Or the ability to create greater economic incentives, where the people creating mods or sharing value to the game are the ones earning value. Or even far more simply, if you're going on a stream and getting hundreds of thousands of people to play a game, you can own a percentage of that success. You can have exposure to the upside of that ecosystem. So I, I think this is where everything shifts to, not just gaming. I think it's where companies shift to. I think it's where when you have tokens that give away value, this is what the sort of you know game theory equilibrium is. It's the, the protocol that shares the most value with everyone wins. And I think this can be much more profitable for games companies as well, which is a really beautiful thing. Like we, we're seeing far higher spend levels. They now have access to things like secondary market fees, which was never before possible. We're pretty much going to take the $130 billion spent on in-game items and we're going to 10x it because anytime you have a secondary market that is sufficient liquidity, derivatives and options and, and all sorts of uh, financial products built on top of it are an order of magnitude larger than the value of the underlying assets. So th this is all kind of where the industry is trending. Um, I, I realize that's a bit far from is esports dying, but the reality is, you know, People who are significant influencers in gaming are going to go to whatever career economics benefit them the most. Well, and speaking of this, I mean, we're talking about pro gamers expressing interest in Web3. And I know that Gold Guardians just partnered with a number of pro gamers and who got exclusive early access to some gameplay. I've been seeing it on crypto Twitter. Tell me a little bit about that. 
I'm, I'm thrilled about this, honestly. Um, this has been such a labor of love internally. Um, you know, we had Chris Clay kind of be leading the charge on this, the, the old director of Magic the Gathering. Um, and the reason I'm excited is we've already done major partnerships with Guild of Guardians. We've signed up with, you know, NRG, with uh, SK, with um, some of the biggest esports companies in the world, Tier 1. And uh, now we have a product that I feel really comfortable shipping to mainstream, or at least in, in, in three months' time. Um, so the core loop is what we've finished, which is basically the experience of, of playing the game. And, and there's you know, a little bit of meta design and polishing and onboarding. We're really going to be doing this in a, a sensible way, which means how do we relentlessly iterate our day three, then day seven, then day 30 retention? Um, day three and day seven are mainly going to be driven by the game's quality. Day 30 is going to be economics and the Web3 value, um, as that's, that's what kind of changes players' long-term motivations. But to the news, which is we've shipped our early access program to Guild of Guardians, I think one week ago, to a bunch of these um, gaming uh, esports players and also a whole bunch of internals. And the metrics have smashed our expectations. So I think um, it was we had uh, internal metrics in terms of retention. We literally doubled them uh, internally. Um, we have, uh, it's supposed to be a second screen game, right? I think I, I literally have it here, which means while we're having this, I'm supposed to be playing it is, is you know, the, the strategy of the game. And we've had an exec meeting where people were just kind of um, playing Guild of Guardians behind the scenes. So I, I think it's been a really phenomenal result. Um, I can't wait for broader beta to be rolled out, which I think is in a f couple of months um, to sort of buyers of the ecosystem. It's a benefit of working at a, at a Web3 gaming company, I guess. You've got a, a valid excuse to be gaming on the side of your exec meeting. <laughs> exactly. I, I don't think it's a habit. But um, we did actually just hire a gaming intern uh, who just plays games all week. Um, and I thought that sounds like an absolute dream job. Yeah, tough life, tough life. All right. Our final bit of news for the day, a Curve Finance exploit put more than $100 million in crypt crypto at risk. I wonder to just get your take on this story and what's your takeaway really? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of takeaways. So I think the first thing is this is a really stark reminder that uh, security is the most important thing in Web3. And it's will A, destroy your company, but more importantly, it will destroy you the trust. Um, and it will destroy our chances of being able to create mainstream products that people love if, if we don't get this right. That is why we have always made the decisions we have. We never once looked at side chains uh, because they were never sufficiently secure for us. It's why we took the bet on ZK technology so early and um, because we thought, well, hey, th this is going to never compromise on security, but it's also going to give us the scale that we need. Um, the Curve exploit in, in particular was kind of, I think, born of a choice of technology stack that was not common. Um, so they used a pre 1.0 version of Viper. Um, so literally not even sort of a complete version. Um, and at the time they chose that Viper was much less popular than Solidity. I remember us looking at this decision internally and there are some advantages to both of them. Mm. But we, whenever you look at those decisions, you really want to make the decision of what is most used because it's going to be the most audited. It's going to be the most battle tested. There's more economic incentives for it to have already been exploited. Therefore, the probability of exploits existing is less. Uh, and so I think with respect to choices of, say, like, compilers that you, you want to build things in, this is a really important uh, point and you want to make the most boring decisions possible. Um, it influenced a lot of our recent decisions in terms of going fully EVM compatible with the mutable ZK VM means we can just use completely traditional compilers. Um, and obviously with the ZK Prover, we have uh, no risks around bridging, which I think is like the number one risk you can basically have in the space. Um, the other way we avoid these risks is Passport being self-custodial. Um, I think that's essential. I think if you're taking custody of, of users' assets, you're running enormous, enormous risks. Um, so I, I think it's a very important reminder that security has to be first and foremost in the space. You know, we've had competitors um, that really it, it was just down to their security is the reason they're no longer here today. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, a, a very important reminder for us to have this as like first and foremost. That is it for our news. Robbie, we'll see you in a little bit. I'm going to get a game demo. I am joined by Clay, game director for Guild of Guardians, previously with Gods Unchained, so uh, uh, an immutable OG, and Ella, who is the staff creative designer for Guild of Guardians. Clay, Ella, welcome both to Between Two Layers. Thanks for having us. I'd love to start, for the uninitiated who don't know of Guild of Guardians, give us the TLDR. What is the quick overview for folks of what Guild of Guardians is? Yeah, so Guild of Guardians is uh, 
squad RPG. Uh, essentially, the the game is running dungeons, and as you run the dungeons, you get loot that you can use to upgrade your guardians, uh, use it to go summon additional guardians. You basically are running dungeons, improving guardians, running dungeons some more, uh, and all in this greater quest to help save the world of Elderim from the dread. Um, and it's very straightforward, uh, but it has this compelling hook that gets into you. Uh, and yeah, that's really what we've been working on for the last five months or so with Mindloader. It's getting that core engine of the game going, of like getting through the dungeons, having that be fun and engaging, you know, key choices along the way, uh, and just having it be a fun game companion uh, to sort of live alongside your life. Um, it's one of the things that uh, when I joined Guild of Guardians in November, you know, looking at where the game was uh, and looking at where the gaming market was for mobile games, a big part of it for me is they need to live alongside your life. It needs to be something I can play on the train for a couple of mm -hmm. minutes, pick it up, put it down. It needs to be something I can play while I'm watching TV uh, with the kids. Um, and that's really where Guild of Guardians is finding its niche. It's something that, you know, you can play as part of your life. And uh, that's feeling really good. That's a great way to frame it. I in my head, I think of Guild of Guardians as one of the oldest first immutable games. Am I right on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've been at Immutable now for four years and you know, joined to really get uh, Gods Unchained uh, up and you know, into game shape. Uh, I joined during the initial Genesis sale when the game was you know, partially functional. We had about 60% of the cards in the, the card set actually working when I joined and it was get the game up and running. And pretty shortly after that, uh, we started work on uh, Guild of Guardians in two sort of different veins. The GU team uh, was internal and the Guild of Guardians team was set up to really be working uh, with partners to bring it to life. Uh, so it's been on a long journey. Not always the, the cleanest journey, I would say, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're, <laughs> we're in pretty good shape today. I will say for the amount of pivots that we've made, it actually has been relatively smooth sailing. And it's been really wonderful to see the changes that have happened since like Clay's come on board because we've managed to pivot so quickly and with such efficiency to create a game that I really truly feel is better than what we had been working on before. And that's mm -hmm. a very exciting feeling in game dev and you don't get those sorts of wins very often. So it's been pretty amazing. Let's talk about that journey a bit. What specifically has evolved and changed? You started to get into that a little bit, Clay. And as part of this, maybe would love to know what have been the big impetuses for that those changes? Has it been player feedback? What has spurred the evolution that it's on now? Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna make it about me because you know everyone love likes it. to talk about themselves. But uh, you know, as a game developer in my career, I've done, pretty much every job there is. I started as a technical artist, uh, animation, VFX, you know, uh, I've done art direction, I've done a whole bunch of game systems uh, creation. And on that, it's moment to moment. So a lot of combat, a lot of AI work for monsters, uh, and then making numbers go up for forever in itemization uh, and otherwise. And, you know, when I came over to help the project, it was starting off as just uh, you know a day a week to look at that moment-to-moment -moment gameplay with where Guild of Guardians was at as an action RPG. And getting my hands on it, uh, you know, they had you know, the core elements you would expect, but they weren't coming together into an experience that felt fun. So mm. we worked uh, for a couple of months on that core gameplay. Uh, and while we made progress, it was clear that the core engine of the game wasn't working. Like, and some of that is just the challenge of action RPGs because they tend to demand full attention. If you're controlling your character completely, you just need to be fully tuned in. Uh, and when you're fully tuned in, if things aren't constantly keeping you engaged, like if you, you can start to feel like you're just doing busy work and that's kind of where it, it hit. Uh, and after a couple of months of iteration, you know, having made games for over 20 years, really quickly saw that we were not on a path to ship in any reasonable time frame. So at the beginning of the year, I proposed a reboot of the game. We did some really quick uh, market analysis. And a lot of this comes down to, too, like in games, you typically have a winner in a category. 
So this would be World of Warcraft in MMORPGs, for instance. Um, and then you kind of have second place, behind second, you know, distant third, and then all of the also rans. And those top three games typically comprised, you know, upwards of like 50, 60, 70 percent of the market share. Uh, so when we were looking at the mobile market, uh, what we saw is uh, ARPGs make up a relatively small uh, percent, you know, single digits. Squad RPGs uh, are around that 25% range. And then when we look at that segmentation, the top five games in uh, squad-based RPGs only comprise about 20% of the market share, which also shows like, hey, this is a place where if we can go into this space with a really compelling game, it gives us a really good chance to win in that space because it hasn't really been consolidated uh, yet. Whereas like in ARPGs, you've got, you know, for instance, Diablo Immortal taking up a huge uh, share of that. Uh, and that led to, okay, let's look at squad-based RPGs. What is a good core loop that could get us there? And the pivot to, you know, where we're at today. Uh, and that switch from Stepico to Mindloader. Uh, and that, that, that was a long journey as well. We explored over 20 potential partners and Mindloader it came out uh, on top and man, uh, I've made a lot of calls in my career, but uh, <laughs> making the call to go to my letter feels like one of the best ones. Uh, as a partner, they have been absolutely amazing partner to work with, uh, which is why we've gotten as far as we've gotten, you know, it's really only been now about six months since we started working on the project. And uh, the game is well beyond what you would expect for something that's six months in. Uh, and to speak to that, though, it is because there was a ton of work that was put into Guild of Guardians before I joined. And that gives us this really solid core of art and other mm -hmm. things that we were able to readapt relatively quickly that if we were starting from scratch, we wouldn't have been able to. So, you know, kudos to the uh, original team for the work that they did on that front as well. That's great. I really appreciate you walking us through that and, and giving that detail. I think it really offers awesome insight and, and demonstrates just how hard it is to build a game. There's so many moving pieces. Ella, would love to have you chime in if you have anything you want to add there. And, and also would love to talk about your background a little bit. I, I think I was hearing from somebody that you're you're a, a game jam participant and, and enjoy that. <laughs> would love to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah, of course. Just really quickly on the note of Mindloader, they have been an amazing partner and me and Clay did actually go to their offices in Shanghai earlier this year, which was an amazing experience, very fun. It was also a lot of work. We would do like nine hours in meetings back to back and then we would go out and, you know, form connections with the team and try to get to know them as best we could, get back to the hotel at two in the morning, have a sleep, go back in. <laughs> but it was really enjoyable and having that experience, getting to work with them, actively together in the same room has also meant that we've been able to iterate even more rapidly than we would have if we hadn't had that experience and done that because it allowed us to get really on the same page and watching them work has just been amazing. But anyway, I could wax poetic about mine load all morning because I'm so impressed with them, but I'm happy to briefly talk about myself. I really do love doing game jams. I think that they're really fun for anyone that doesn't know what a game jam is. A game jam is typically a 48 hour window where you sign up for a game jam and sometimes you have a team ready ahead of time, but a lot of the time people just go in and find a team in the moment. Some game jams have themes, others don't. And you pretty much spend 48 hours making a game together. And you don't have to release that. It can just be that you're practicing your skills or that you want to try something new or you want to work in a new discipline. A lot of people will try new things. So I've seen programmers going to be writers and I've seen writers trying to do audio and things like that. So it's a really fun way to experiment and also to foster a stronger sense of community. And I really enjoy participating in them, but I very much have a bit of an outcome that I want from them. So I go in and I get a little team together and I work with a few people regularly and I'm like, okay, let's spend 48 hours making a game that we care about. Let's polish it up. And then I will pay to release it for free on Steam. And it's a nice way for people to get their portfolios built out and things like that. But we always have a very strong, I guess, lean towards making games that explore mental health issues and that can be a little bit raw and a little bit real. And we really enjoy what we do and I love what I do. So that's something that I spend a lot of my free time doing. That's amazing. Can you tell us about one one of the games you've released that 
perhaps yes. you, you're you're most proud of? I would love to. Let me spruik myself. So I released a game with my team called You Will Not Remain, and the not is in brackets. So it's kind of an Evangelion reference for any nerds listening. Anime, anyway. And mm-hmm. if, especially if you live in Melbourne and you would like to be re-traumatized about the pandemic and lockdown, that is the game for you. So it's <laughs> what a, what a sales. sales pitch. <laughs> it's basically a game that is like 2D and it's story based and it's all pixel art. It's beautiful. It's got a full soundtrack. It's only like half an hour. So if you've got the time and you'd like to be a bit sad, please go and play it and leave me a review. Don't feel like Let me to. give you this pitch for a game that I've developed. It's <laughs> full like of depression and sadness. It will leave you in tears and questioning yes. existence. But That's it's exactly. quick. <laughs> um, but it's about like an eldritch horror, which is the metaphor for the pandemic and you're like stuck in an apartment complex. However, if it helps sell it to anyone, there is a dog in it that's a greyhound. And that greyhound is called Lambshank. And if you like that kind of absurdist humour, there is a little bit of that in the game. And Lambshank is very cute. So hopefully Aww. that makes it a bit more appealing. <laughs> You will not remain. All right, that's that's the plug. I love it. Uh, well, let's get into Guild of Guardians now with that tee up. I think y'all have have something for us to take a look at here, and I'm I'm excited to dive in. I can guarantee that Guild of Guardians won't re-traumatize you. So I mean, that's a pretty good starting point. All right. So tell us what we are looking at here. We're diving into the Guild of Guardians uh, beautiful corner build. Uh, captured some footage uh, when I was playing through. Uh, This sort of takes you through the basics of the game. You grab your guardians, you go to a dungeon, you know, within the dungeon, you can change the formation that your guardians are in. Part of Guild of Guardians is uh, deep strategic depth. (sighs) That's extra deep. Uh, Basically, (laughs) a whole lot of simple choices that compound into wildly different results. So right here, I'm picking a rune, then I'm picking a room. And after each... Uh, dungeon room, that's essentially part of the path you're you're going down. Like, which rune build are you pulling together? Is it appropriate for your squad of guardians and their skills? Uh, is it appropriate for the, the, the monsters in the dungeon you're facing? And then with the rooms, it's uh, a bit of this meta cycle of you know, knowing what equipment you want to go craft, picking rooms that have loot that uh, includes components of that equipment, looking for new recipes for new pieces of equipment to craft, uh, leveling up your guardians, uh, and you making sort of key calls along the way of do I go into a combat room uh, because my guardians are in pretty good shape uh, and get additional runes and rewards, or do I go to a healing room? If you go to a healing room, you don't get a rune choice at the end of it, so you're foregoing some like later power, but all of your guardians will be healed up. And because it's a roguelike, a uh, key part of that is you will not make it to the end of most dungeon runs. Uh, in this one, if I remember correctly, I die to the the boss. That's okay. Uh, you keep all of the progress that you've made. Uh, and that, again, is used to then go power up your guardians and sort of dive back into the mix. The, the thing that I, I actually saw play out uh, a lot of times in the community, uh, because this was a pretty big change for people who had been around from that action RPG uh, to the squad-based RPG, uh, in general, a lot of people not happy with it uh, up front when it was mm. announced. But then getting into the gameplay and like within like five minutes, there'll be a Discord message of like, this isn't at all like what it used to be. And then like 25 minutes later, I'm like, the game's so simple, but it's so compelling. And then, like 45 minutes later, it's like pe- they're asking like, how, how do I do X, Y, Z because I'm so completely uh into it engrossed yeah and like this that's part of what it is is it does get it it's hooks in you and yeah i can say from like a a game developer perspective uh you one of the things that i've gotten really good at over the years is when i'm playing yeah stepping outside myself and just watching how my brain is uh you know going through and it is that sort of compounding of all of these little choices along the way uh that it's like yep i've made the right choice here that feels good uh, and those add up a lot as you're making these little choices on how to progress. And then when you hit those big moments of you know, acquiring a new guardian, getting a new piece of gear, uh, it sort of takes you the rest of the way. So really happy with where that core engine of the game is. It gives us a lot to work with as we go into you know, live operations and beyond, just in constructing new dungeon challenges, uh, new monster challenges, 
um, and then you know letting players go, you know, solve the problems essentially. Uh, and that is a lot of what it comes down to in game design. It's creating a really rich possibility space for players to go explore, uh, and for designers to design within. So you know, part of that is like looking forward into launch and beyond. You know, we've got already roughly you know six to eight months of content planned post release that we're working on because you want to go to launch with that in the bag, uh, particularly for a game like this where you've got the that live operations component and making sure that we've got systems that let us you know, configure things in lots of interesting ways so there's always new challenges for players to face. Mm. Uh, it's kind of where we sit. Yeah. Let's talk about the Web3 component of this. How have you thought about integrating the NFT piece without it compromising on the fun at all? So that's a, the challenging uh, part. So like right now, uh, doing some crafting in the game and one of the hard calls uh, that uh, was made was for equipment crafting to be Web2 based. Now, mm. this is one of those things where, yes, equipment is one of those, it just kind of at surface value makes sense for uh, them to be NFTs themselves. It was part of the original plan. But it actually creates uh, a lot of challenges on the progression and like gameplay loops front of if you've got equipment NFTs, it actually allows you to bypass content and Accelerating your play can be very good. Bypassing content actually can destroy a game uh, to the point where people just don't want to play it. Uh, we saw this uh, with you know, the Diablo 3 auction hall is sort of a classic uh, example of how like being able to buy power directly just doesn't quite work. When it comes to that sort of Web 2 to Web 3 side, a lot of what we've looked at is how can Web 3 solve problems better? So. Uh, with Guild of Guardians, our approach to the overall economy is you can play it as a Web2 game, but if you want to be more efficient, you're going to want to get into that Web3 space over time. And this is really key because it'll let us onboard traditional gamers into a Web2 uh, friendly game uh, and then get them to the point where uh, through our sort of internal uh, tutorial guides and otherwise, uh, get them comfortable with the idea of you know, going and targeting certain things things directly on the marketplace and avoiding some of the traditional like uh, mechanics of having to summon a whole bunch of guardians to get the one you want versus being able to go to Web3 and purchase the guardian you want directly off the marketplace. Mm. Uh, so guardians are currently you know, primarily the NFTs uh, out uh, in the ecosystem today. They will remain a key part of that NFT side of things. And then on the equipment side, it's uh, early on, you're going to be completely Web2 based in the crafting. But as you get deeper in, there will be advanced crafting components that you can use to craft your equipment. And what we're targeting is those advanced uh, crafting components to be part of that trading ecosystem. So it's not that you're buying the equipment itself, but you can accelerate uh, how you progress by picking some of the component pieces together. And this is also, you're just looking at how I play games. One of the key pieces for me is if I craft a piece of gear myself, I feel much more attached to it than if I'm just buying it from somebody else. So yeah, having some of that work to be done by the player is the overall plan. So we've been looking at footage from your beautiful corner demo, which I think just recently wrapped up. What is that? is I guess my question. And I think you have some more footage here, so I'd love for you to explain what we're looking at now as well. Cool, yeah, really quick what we're looking at now. Uh, Elle is in a development build, so we're uh, moving beyond that beautiful corner into our friends and family build. Development build, uh, expect bugs and other glitches uh, because we're doing it live here. Uh, in terms of a beautiful corner though, uh, been making games for quite a while, and a beautiful corner for me is an experience that you craft that people can play and at the end of an hour they want to keep playing and that seems simple mm. and it seems obvious but it's actually quite hard to to get to uh, and you know with the beautiful corner build of guild of guardians uh, we essentially crafted about three hours of gameplay and worked on those systems over the first five months of development to get it into a place where you know the look is there the feel is there and the spirit of the game is represented. So essentially it's testing out the core engine of the game. And we hit a point internally uh, that for me is a magical moment where we were in an internal playtest, and the playtest was over 
and we all kept playing and like 15 minutes after the play test finally it's like hey guys we're all late for our next meetings we really need to to go do this that's like the art side of it like that's a really good sign for me as a game director that it's working and then when mindloader delivered the 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 first like full beautiful corner build a couple of weeks later we were actually in shanghai and we were in those nine hour meetings and you know we were playing while we're in the meetings all day long <laughs> And it was a little bit of competition to see who could get further in. After that, we're in a cab going out to dinner. And I'm like, clearly everyone's ready to be done with Guild of Guardians. And like, literally everyone popped out their phones and kept playing. And I'm like, okay. Like, so this is hard to explain, I think, to people who don't work in games. But when you're working on a game day after day after day, sometimes you just need to step away and get a break. And when people are still captured after a really long day, it's like, that's special. That's like, yeah. that's magic. And, you know, similar like previous games, like Magic the Gathering Arena, I knew that that one was in a really good shape when I got into work on a Monday. And literally everyone in the office that I'm passing is talking to somebody else about games they had played that weekend because they played you know, all weekend long in the, the, the tests. So similar, like we're in that kind of vibe where it's just working, it captures you. And... Part of why that's so important is it lets us know that we're on the right path. And it's just human nature. When you really believe in what you're making and it's really working, it just drives everyone uh, all the more. And the beautiful corner really worked. So we just finished up uh, the public uh, playtest of that. We had about 172, if I want to get very specific, uh, people who got into that across our community, uh, across media. and. There's art to the beautiful corner and some of the just like feeling of these things. And then there's a science to it. And I've never had a beautiful corner with numbers like we had uh, for Guild of Guardians. It completely blew my expectations out of the water. Um, we had hoped to have somewhere in like the 40% range still playing after an hour. Because this is a build with no tutorial. Um, there's like none of the things that like make a game easy. Um, but we had 82% uh, make it through that first hour. Oh my we gosh. had uh, 65% played more than 12 hours, which is absolutely preposterous because it only had three hours of core gameplay. And then you're essentially looping through the same stuff over again. And we had a one player played for 45, another for 43 hours. And this is 45 and 43 hours over a three-day play test. Like this is an absolutely insane amount of uh, play time. And oh my God, that's 15 hours a Day? Yeah, like that's that's like that, I'm on, you know, on, on uh, Discord. <laughs> yeah, like I'm with like in the Discord, we're like, hey, you really should sleep. And he's like, I got three hours of sleep. And I'm like, that's not enough sleep, my dude. <laughs> um, but you know, things went really well. We've got a lot of feedback, you I'll know, say. from the community uh, out of that, and you know, in what uh, Elle has been playing, uh, we're already starting to work on that, and you know. It's just, it's a really great place to be. That's amazing. Congratulations. So the, the next obvious question, and, and really my final question is, what's next for Guild of Guardians? What should folks check out? And when does this open up to the broader public? Yeah, so I think the, the cliche in gaming is when it's done. Uh, but a big part of you know, this this move to the, the new squad-based RPG was time and delivery. So the next major build is going to be friends and family. This will be mostly internal um, marketing and I'm, the community want to get their hands on it and we may do some, uh, but the next really big step will be uh, closed beta, uh, which is not that far away. It's just about uh, three months uh, from now is what we're targeting. Um, and that will be a larger opportunity. We'll, instead of hundreds of people in, we'll be looking to get you know thousands of people in. And what we're building right now is some of those things I was talking about that are missing in a beautiful corner. So the beautiful corner really is just that core of the game. And now it's taking that core and setting up all the systems to bring people on the journey on how to learn how to use it and play with it. and setting up the first time user experience you know on ella's side it's getting some of that narrative into the game so as you're playing through the dungeons learning more about the world what, what why uh, the guardians are doing what they're doing uh, and then extending systems uh beyond so beyond that core starting to layer in other elements of gameplay that take you from playing <laughs> I should be saying, taking you from playing about three hours of gameplay to, you know, playing hundreds. Um, but we're already... 25 really, hours. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, and like, for closed beta, like, if 
we had people over a couple of weeks in the 45 hours range, I think I'd be pretty happy, um, but we're well on that path. So some of those other elements are after you get through the primary game, we have a system called the Endless Dungeon. Uh, where players can compete you know, in leaderboards to sort of go as deep as they can. And we're working on uh, you know, some of that leaderboard tech uh, as well. Um, that competitive live operations of leaderboards and events is going to be really important, I think, to the long-term uh, sustainability of the game. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of full steam ahead. Uh, there are little things like already in this build, like one of the most requested features was speeding up combat. So there's a little 2x button. Um, and, you know, when working with Mind Loader, it's, again, one of the things I absolutely love with working uh, working with them on these things is I know Unity pretty in-depth, and for features like the speed up, I'm like, hey, I know we're, we're nearly there. Like, can we get this in? And, you know, next week it's in the build. Um, they're just wow. so iterative, and uh, it lets us move so quickly. The only other thing I would call out, like, in that relationship with Mind Loader um, one of the things we really wanted to set up was uh, letting their team move as quickly as possible without having to double check every single last thing through us. So a lot of those initial trips to Shanghai were aligning with them on the direction of the game, on that narrative piece, on all the world building rules, on the art style, on the game systems and what they needed to accomplish. And I want to be explicit here, like they move forward so quickly because they're able to do these iterative loops on their own and not have to double check uh, every last thing with us. We're obviously they're playing through. We give lots of feedback, but uh, they're really charging ahead. Uh, and yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, the the closed beta in particular will be a, a pretty major leap uh, from the beautiful corner. And that's only another about four months of development. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're moving quick. Full steam ahead. Well, congratulations on all the success. Ella Clay, thank you both so much for joining us here on Between Two Layers. This has been a blast, and I just cannot wait to continue to track your progress. It's it's moving quick. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. It's been lovely to get to talk about Guild of Guardians because me and Clay obviously love talking about Guild of Guardians, but it's usually to each other. So getting to do it all night <laughs> is always nice. <laughs> And now it's time for a question from our community. This question comes from OX Stark, who asks, Robbie, what is the first game type you expect to lead the mainstream adoption? That is a great question and one I can't necessarily predict. If you saw the content we put on our Twitter, I think two days ago, We've got 10 different genres on our platform. They're pretty widely distributed. I think the most popular is uh, RPGs or MMORPGs. Um, I, I'm pretty bullish on RPGs in general, especially mobile distributed RPGs, and that's because collectability is at its core. They're highly accessible. Um, so a lot of what we think about when we think about genre is what's the TAN? What's the total addressable market? How many people like to play this genre? Um, that's a really important sort of place where, where you, you can choose strategically the potential of success to your game. And the second is, you know, where do we think collectability and ownership is going to make the biggest difference? And that's obviously in multiplayer games where asset ownership is a core part of the game loop. Um, so those are probably what I take the, the bet on first. I also think we're gonna see new genres emerge that we didn't even expect. I mean, what, what genre would you call a Roblox or a Fortnite creative? It's, it's probably more of a platform. Mm. And the genres that emerge out of that are actually you know, tens of different of, of, of types of games. Um, and we're going to see those platforms with incentives on steroids, um, leveraging sort of creator economics and, and Web3 assets to incentivize 
um, development. So I'm also very bullish on UGC platforms plus Web3. Um, but I think they'll take a little bit longer to mature. I mean, you actually only really saw Roblox as an inflection point like 10 to 15 years after that uh, platform was, was developed. And obviously, Fortnite already has major network effects and they still are. It's a lot of effort to kickstart this cold start problem. Dare we say metaverse? Dare we use the M word? Ah, uh, I dare not. Yeah, exactly. You didn't. You you conveniently skirted it. You said platform. I was like, it's on the tip of my tongue. I was like, meta. <laughs> Joining me now from the set of his film noir movie studio where Alex is making his, I'm kidding. For those of you who are listening on podcast, joining me now is Alex Connolly, CTO and co-founder at Immutable. And he has uh, a lighting situation that is casting him in, in partial shadow. So I'm making a joke about his film noir acting debut. But Alex, welcome to Between Two Layers. Super excited to be here. Really excited. <laughs> So let's start with just super basics. Your CTO at Immutable, help us understand what exactly does that entail? Maybe it's like a, what does your day look like? Yeah, fantastic. So my role at Immutable, I run everything uh, engineering, product and design, uh, which basically means that if we build it, uh, it ends up having something to do with me at some point. Uh, most of my, my day-to-day, you, know, you, you have to dive at all layers of altitude, right? So that's everything from overall macro product strategy to hey, this button looks like it might be the, the wrong color. Uh, hopefully you get more of the first column and, and fewer of the second. Uh, but I think it's really important you know, to be able, you know, really in tune with our customers, able to understand all of our tech and able to build great products that game developers and players love. So you're approached, I'm sure, all the time by game studios who are not Web3 native. How do you talk them through this tech and what you all do at Immutable and maybe even your unique value prop without getting them too intimidated by all the Web3 buzzwords? Yeah, I think it's it's a, a, a classic balance that we have to keep striking. We want to make sure that we're solving real and genuine problems. And that means that we actually do have to talk about really deep technical concepts all the time. This stuff is hard. It's challenging. We're you know, on the frontier of solving these, these new problems. But at the same time, if it doesn't mean anything to game studios, they won't use it and players will never get to experience it. So most of the time when we're talking about Immutable to these game studios, we talk in terms of goals rather than in terms of products or Mm. objectives, at least at first. So we talk about you want to build a Web3 game and you want to build a Web3 game because you're excited about the potential for monetization, you're excited about better engagement for players, you're excited about a new model of game development, which is less extractive, you're excited about this new industry and tapping into this new audience. But you find that when doing so, you encounter a number of really important challenges. Right? And those are some of those challenges are really well known, challenges like scale. Some of those challenges are less well known, things like developer experience, things like compliance, like across the board, there's a whole bunch of challenges. And Immutable's overarching mission is to solve those problems for game developers so that they can f- concentrate on the things that they're best at, creating really fun, compelling games that leverage this technology. And we can be that middleware layer that solves their problems so that they can go and scale those games to millions of players. So we really see ourselves as solving the problem of how can you build Web3 games that can actually scale to mainstream audiences? We want to just make that continually easier and easier and easier for developers to unlock true ownership for all players. I'm sold. I'm ready to develop my game on Immutable. Uh, so speaking of buzzwords, I'm going to use the, the biggest buzzword right now, which is the Immutable ZK EVM. This can be one of those intimidating concepts for folks. So maybe talk us through what this is, but specifically how why you as a technical founder are so excited about the Immutable ZK EVM. So we are indeed incredibly excited about Immutable ZK EVM. For those of you who follow us on, on socials, this is something that we talk about constantly. There's a ton of awesome detail. I, you know, I really recommend if you want to dive, dive into it more, we've got amazing blog articles you can read. Uh, you know, I, I may have written some of them, so I may be a little bit biased. Uh, but what we actually have when we talk about Immutable ZK EVM, the best way to think about Immutable is really two layers of a stack. And they're not the normal two layers that we think of on this podcast, right? They're actually a new two layers. And that layer is a, a layer that we call the platform layer. But we have a number of the products that Immutable offers to make developing games better. That's things like Passport, like the order book, like Checkout, like Minting. And we'll talk a little bit about those later, I hope. But we also have what we call the roll-up layer. And the roll-up layer is kind of the foundational infrastructure of Immutable. And they're the baseline environments where game developers issue assets to players and where assets are actually traded. And today, the one that everyone is most familiar with is ImmutableX, which we build in partnership with the, with the Starkware team, which is an application-specific roll-up specifically targeted at games. Right? So it basically provides a really great environment for things like gas-free minting, gas-free trading, etc. 
Immutable ZK EVM is a new offering at that roll-up layer of the stack, right? The chain layer of the stack. And we're incredibly excited about it because what it's basically going to allow us to have is the same awesome you know, scalability uh, that we get access to with Immutable X that, and that our customers are used to, the same secure Ethereum security. Uh, so we still will talk about what it means to be a ZK roll-up in a second. But now we get to be what's called EVM compatible. That's a term that means lots of different things to, to lots of different people, right? And really what that mostly means is that means that this chain, which game developers will be able to deploy on, looks a lot like Ethereum. It just looks like a faster, optimized for games version of Ethereum. This is incredibly important because there are so many marketplaces, ecosystem tools, games, etc., that all target EVM environments, which basically means they expect things to look like Ethereum. At the moment, Immutable X is incredibly optimized for games, but for many, uh, particularly third-party developers, it's difficult to integrate with because it does have that you know, fully custom interface that you have to build new stuff uh, to integrate with, which is why, for instance, a lot of your favorite marketplaces as a user might not be available on Immutable X. Immutable ZK EVM will change the game, right? Because it means that we will have the ability to integrate with all of these tools that expect Ethereum compatibility and Ethereum standards. And the ZK part of that is obviously something that we're working on really closely with the Polygon team. It's an incredibly exciting series of developments, which basically means that unlike all the other, you know, the fast EVM chains that pop up all over the place, but this chain will actually mean that on this chain, your assets will still have the same security as you do when you're trading or minting assets on Ethereum, just with a much higher throughput, which is an incredibly exciting uh, you know, journey in the, the history of the Ethereum scaling space. So a couple follow-ups to that. First, this means basically people can write in, de developers could write in Solidity code, which is what's used on Ethereum, versus a different code when they are on Immutable X. Is that right? That's exactly right. So people will be able to write in Solidity, but not just people will be able to write in Solidity. The RPC interfaces for the chain will be the same. It really will look, for most consumers, Immutable ZK EVM is what we call a type one ZK EVM, which means we've invested lots of extra time in partnership with the Polygon Zero team in ensuring that this chain looks as close to Ethereum as possible, which means that it won't just be, hey, can you write your Solidity code on chain? It'll mean that all your dev tools also work out of the box, mm. which is something that you can easily get into, get tripped up by with a, a type two or type three ZK EVM. We've really made the investment in making sure that not just your Solidity code, but everything else will work out of the box like it would on an Ethereum. And so you mentioned that that, that X technology, that initial roll-up technology in the Immutable X was really designed for gaming. Is the Immutable ZK EVM specifically designed for gaming as well, or is it something different? So the Immutable ZK EVM is also specifically designed for gaming. You know, Immutable, we really care, as I said before, about unblocking that ability to have mainstream games. And that means that we want to customize all of our products, including our roll-ups, to be you know, dedicated uh, for gaming. Where there's a trade-off between Immutable ZK EVM and Immutable X is that Immutable ZK EVM basically allows for more flexibility because you can write custom smart contract code, which means that you can write things, you can write things apart from games, or you can build games mm -hmm. that have more complex on-chain mechanics, which you can't do on Immutable X. It might be really, maybe a really easy way of thinking about it is Immutable X puts you on rails for building a really, I guess, a template type of game, which is fantastic for many game developers. It makes it really easy, really fast to spin up. It's amazing. And Immutable ZK EVM for game developers that want to have more complex economies and more complex ownership mechanics, Immutable ZK EVM offers them an option to bring over the power of smart contracts while still retaining access to all the platform products like Passport, Audible, and Checkout that I talked about before. So the million dollar question, when will Immutable ZK EVM be available to developers? Yeah, so I think this is indeed the, the million dollar question. I think even internally, this is something that we talk about. Uh, I get asked this question really frequently. So one thing I'm incredibly excited to, to share is that we are now testing the test net of Immutable ZK EVM with a large set of, of internal partners, right? And I'd say that maybe, you know, it depends by the time this podcast live, I think you might be seeing some exciting movement on general availability uh, for a test net. And we're very hopeful that we'll, we'll certainly have a, a main net this year. And I think we'll be hopefully you know, around the start of, of, uh, of Q4. So we are very excited about the progress that's been made. We're you know, on, on, on or ahead of schedule almost across the board, which is really exciting. I think games are already starting to test these products. And I think if you're a game developer, uh, please reach out to our team and we'll see if you can join our early access program. Impressive. No, no team in Web3 has ever been on time, let alone early in shipping anything. So congratulations on, uh, on that. Uh, let's switch over to your work on Passport. This is obviously a, a really important project initiative for Immutable. It's a big part of the roadmap. Why is this so important to you personally? So Passport is important simply because I, as a user, like 
I've experienced the challenges that come with being a Web3 gamer. You know, I've played these games. I, we've built some of the, you know, the first ever on-chain games. We've really experienced the hardship. And the truth of the matter is that the existing suite of technologies simply won't enable us to achieve that goal of onboarding mainstream users. Mm. The onboarding drop-offs, drop-offs are too high. The fact that you know, it's really difficult to, to get on-ramped funds, the need for better innovation at the consumer layer has been really clear to many you know, game studios, many platforms. And you'll see lots and lots of products on the market that try to solve these types of problems. What we think we have with Passport that's incredibly special is first that we have a wallet that's really focused on games. So we've actually made the decisions that are necessary to unblock not just, hey, am I sending your know, financial or DeFi transactions, but hey, if I'm crafting Alluvium assets inside Alluvium, do I really need to see an extra confirmation pop up? I should I probably trust Alluvium for those assets. Like a whole bunch of gaming specific determinations that our wallet mm-hmm. can make, and a whole bunch of gaming specific user experience benefits that we can offer. Simply because it just you must have that. If you want to actually be a competitive mobile game that can do performance marketing or other types of competition with existing Web2 games, you have to bring a level of experience that makes sense to players. So the Web3 parts are not completely out of the way. You know, they'll still need to be there at the key moments so that we can actually realize these benefits. But for most of the game, you actually can onboard, play the game. It feels like you're engaging in a really high, pol- high quality, polished mainstream mobile game. Like for those of uh, you uh, in the Guild of Guardians community who've been part of the, the beautiful corner uh, you know, alpha test there, they will see some of the, like, I guess, the, the quality of games we're developing. We want to make sure that the quality of games is backed up by a suite of platform products that lets you actually have a really powerful user experience. But the second really important thing about Immutable Passport, which we think is really uh, differentiating and important in the industry, is that you have one Immutable Passport across all your games and all your marketplaces. It's not one wallet per game or one wallet per marketplace. That stuff looks really good in a demo or a highlights video, and it seems really, uh, really slick. But as soon as your user tries to onboard into a second game, they run into a ton of challenges. They're like, oh, I thought I had already onboarded money. I put money in my like Call of Duty wallet, and now it's not available in my League of Legends wallet. And neither of them are available on OpenSea, or, so, or neither of them are available on my favorite third-party marketplace. And so you end up with a user experience that's incredibly fragmented and just doesn't make sense to most users. And so with Passport, because of all the hard work that our you know, engineering teams uh, have done, we're in a position where we're able to have one secure Passport wallet across all your immutable games and all your immutable marketplaces. This makes it much more attractive for developers to build in the immutable ecosystem because they get to piggyback off all of those users but also much, just a much higher quality user experience because you don't have to waste time re-registering for all these different games, maintaining and managing diff- uh, different accounts. We think this is an incredibly important step forward for Web3 Gaming. So then the $2 million question, can developers use this now in their games when they build on Immutable? What's the timeline? So if you're a game that's building on Immutable X, uh, you can use this now. Right? If you're a game that's building on Immutable ZK EVM, uh, I think you might be really excited. Uh, I think certainly by, by the time this podcast is out, you will be able to to use this uh, on Immutable ZK EVM. I believe we're actually publishing the documentation uh, later on today. So this is a product that is ready, live, and available today for developers to start integrating. It's not a fully complete product. There are a number of different things that we're still trying to build out. There's a really detailed roadmap that we'll be sharing as well, which has like all the things that are necessary to make this wallet undisputedly the best wallet in gaming. But if you're building a game today and you want to have an authentication system out of the box, you want to have a wallet system out of the box that provides really powerful transactions uh, and on-ramp capabilities without compromising user experience, we think the Passport is just a a complete no-brainer for games that are building on Immutable. In your conversations with studios, game studios, especially those who are not native to blockchain gaming, how important is, I guess what I would call like the all-in-one approach that it feels like Immutable takes where you you build out, you have the the tools, the wallets, like it's all there. How important has that been when you talk to to game devs and studios? So it is so valuable to these studios that they're able to work with Immutable as their primary developer platform and partner in the space. A lot of these studios, they're looking for guidance, right? They're looking for a suite of technology they can trust. And this means that they want to have someone provide them with, okay, they've got the blockchain infrastructure. They've got the wallet infrastructure. Obviously, Immutable, like our goal is to be that one-stop shop for most games who are building in the Web3 space. This doesn't mean that we literally provide everything. Obviously, there's many other tools and services that these developers might need to use either in Web3 or in Web2 gaming. But particularly for those core pieces of the puzzle that are so central to the game's user experience, Immutable can walk that entire journey with game developers. And that just means that they're like, their building experience is smoother. Their commercial experience is smoother. They have a partner they can call that they know is going to be there and will be dependable for them. 
And we're actually in a position to offer this as a product for planet scale games. Like there are a lot of Web3 gaming platforms out there that like have, you know, piece, like little pieces of the puzzle. Immutable being in a position to offer, you know, not just the whole puzzle, but also the ability to take that, take that puzzle and make it available to games with millions of active players, which are actually seeing mainstream scale, which are adopted in major app stores, et cetera. That's an incredibly, I think, important, I mean, we think of it as a differentiator for us, but more importantly, it's a differentiator for customers. Like it, it makes their lives way easier because they actually can, you know, they're using the same API keys and they're using the same organization setups. And that stuff is like, that vertical integration is incredibly powerful. We found at, you know, helping developers navigate the still complex journey of Web3, doing that with a really strong commercial and technical partner in Immutable just is mm-hmm. so much easier for most games. So we're sitting here in the middle of this bear market. What do you see on the horizon as you look ahead for this space? Obviously, we're both bullish on blockchains. We're both bullish on on blockchain gaming. But where do you really see this going in the next 6, 12, 18 months? Yeah, so I think... We, I think the 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 bear the bear market conditions is a, a fantastic time for building. Uh, what I think certainly as someone who, who uh, spends, you know, I come from an engineering background. I'm I'm used to having my my head you down. You have credibility very, when you say it. You're like that. Right, this is what and, I do. Yeah, and and when you're in a bull market, there's just so much exciting stuff. Every day you log into Twitter, there's 20 new things that are all incredibly exciting and. Everyone's jumping on them, and you really feel like, oh, I've got to, I've got to chase that, or we might be left behind. The bear market gives you clarity, right? And the bear market gives you the ability to really focus on delivering amazing experiences for developers, for players, etc. And so that's why you know, a lot of the product development that I've, I've just been sharing is actually enhanced by that, uh, rather than uh, degraded by that, which is, which is fantastic. Right? It just means that we have the like unilateral focus on unblocking these challenges that are holding mainstream games back. At the same time, there's so much like foundational layer innovation that I'm really excited about in the, in the blockchain space over the next you know, uh, year to 18 months. I think actually even the rise of ZKVMs as a foundational technology, that's actually something that's been ahead of schedule. I think if you think back two years ago, we probably thought they were three to four years away. And we now have you know, live in production ZKVMs in a number of places. Obviously, those are still maturing. We also have you know, much better infrastructure for application-specific blockchains or superchains or subnets or supernets, much better uh, experience there. I think we are still early in that market and we're going to see a lot of, I think one thing Immutable is really excited about is there'll obviously be the potential for some games to have their own blockchain, uh, for instance. Uh, what Immutable can do because of our vertical integration is not just, okay, here's a chain, you're out on your own, you don't have any of the infrastructure that you're plugged in across everywhere else, you've left behind all the liquidity and all the user experience. You know, we talked about fragmentation earlier. Imagine not just your wallets, but your assets are fragmented off on many, many different chains. The fact that Immutable is vertically integrated means that we can actually smooth out those types of experiences really easily. So let's say that you're a user on one chain, you're buying an asset on another, uh, and Immutable uh, you know, contro- controls you know, the bridge, both those chains and the wallet. We can create a user experience where that just doesn't you know, mean much to the gamer. Right? The gamer can just say, hey, I've got $20 over here. I want to buy this asset. Click and done. That's an incredibly powerful future to be building towards. And I think a lot of the foundational pieces of the, of the stack uh, are slotting in place. I mean, I think I'm, I'm super excited about you know, things like privacy. I think there's, there's so much exciting development that's, that goes on in the blockchain space. It obviously doesn't get as much visibility uh, when you know, the bear market conditions are on. But I think there is a like, incredibly powerful wave of foundational development that will enable it. You know, we, we talk about how close we are to mainstream games today in terms of technical capability compared to how we were five years ago. It's absolutely night and day. Compared to three years ago, it's still night and day. Like The massive influx of development work and really powerful technical teams in the space has given the, is giving the space amazing you know, acceleration of velocity even through the bear market. I love it. I, I love the optimism. Are, are there other? Are there any other products or things you're working on at Immutable that you're particularly excited about? Yeah. So one thing we're very excited about is what the product we call Immutable Checkout, and this is an evolution of our existing products, which come with things like you know on ramps, bridges, withdrawals. Like one of the biggest and most challenging experiences uh, is actually moving funds into and out of Immutable X at the moment. So both the experience around you know, on-ramps, right? So either moving funds from layer one or using like uh, fiat or, or cash money. Uh, and then the, the withdrawal process. It's the by far the biggest thing that we get customer support feedback about. And some of those challenges are things that are you know, in, innate to ZK rollups. And so we've had to do a ton of work to, to navigate around them. And our new product, Immutable Checkout, will not just solve, we think, some of the user experience challenges of, hey, 
how can we make it easier to deposit money into the chain? How can we make it easier for people to withdraw money to layer one? What about off ramps into their bank accounts or similar similar types of things that mainstream users just expect? But also, how can we integrate that into the transaction flow so that, hey, you're at the point when you click at the moment, you know, if you buy something in the Web2 world and you, you're on you know, a Shopify store or something, you load up your cart, you click checkout, and it doesn't say, hey, we're checking your bank right now. We're going to make sure that you've got enough money. Like, it lets you just kind of go through to the, to the end of the pro- purchase process and then complete the, pro- the, the checkout. Right? And that makes sense because the store wants to sell you things and wants you to actually complete those purchases. At the moment, a lot of Web3 games and marketplaces sort of block users at the point of, hey, you don't have enough money here. And then really make it so hard for them to move money on, on ramps, like bridges, all those types of things. The user experience, uh, you know, we should share, I think sometimes we, we sort of do user testing of these types of flows. And actually seeing mainstream gamers try to struggle with these flows uh, would be completely hilarious uh, if it yeah. wasn't critical to us being able to succeed in these markets. And so Checkout is a product we're very excited about. We think will not just smooth out those edges around how to move money into and out of Immutable ZK EVM and Immutable X, but will also be integrated throughout the product so that whenever you're sending a transaction, you're not blocked, you're not held back. If you, if you don't have the funds, we can help with that. If you have, the, you have the amount of money, but it's in the wrong currency, we can help with that. If it's in the wrong currency and it's on the wrong chain and you need to swap it, deposit it, and then use it to fill the order, we can help with that. And the best thing is like, because we're, uh, again, that vertical integration, because of the integration with products like the order book, Immutable is able to make sure that your experience is not, hey, I did this weird complicated on-ramp of funds. And by the time I did it, someone else had bought the asset that I was trying to buy. Uh, which is obviously a terrible experience. You know, you're on ramp fifty dollars, and someone's already bought the thing, and now you're stuck with fifty dollars in a currency you don't understand. We're actually able to hold that order for you and let you complete that checkout. So the vertical integration there and the new addition of, of checkout to our product stable, I think, will be a massive UX uplift, and we'll solve some of the the key problems that you know people experience today on Immutable X. Alex, thank you so much for being here for walking us through all of this. I have one final question for you. I know you are a big gaming nerd. You don't just walk the you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk, whatever the phrase would be. What are the yeah. games you're playing a lot right now? Oh, great question. I think at the moment, uh, so like I think I'm I used to play a really large amount of first person shooter games, Team Fortress 2, Counter Strike, you know, Valorant. Uh, at the moment, I'm in a, a bit of a self-imposed uh, break from uh, shooter games. Unfortunately, uh, one thing that that uh, comes from you know, running running a company like Immutable is my aim is really suffering due to my lack of uh, my lack of practice, and I'm far too competitive <laughs> to to play shooter games and be mediocre at them. So I'm playing a ton of like uh, I think I'm playing you know, a bunch of Crusader Kings. I played a few games of Civilization the other day. Single player games, much more mellow. I'm sort of like you know trying to 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 make sure that I can play games that I can definitely win. Uh, and not games that will, that will make me frustrated on the on the shooter side. Keep that heart rate down. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here, Alex. We will check in with you again, I have no doubt, to hear all the updates on everything you guys are building and working on. Thank you so much. To close the show today, we have Robbie Ferguson with a final thought. The most important thing is that royalties can be set and then they are immutable and they can't be worked around, but also they can't be changed on, you know, end end users. And our philosophy here is very simple, which is the market will set what they think are acceptable royalties. If a game developer is monetizing purely via royalties, the architecture might be entirely different. They may not ever want to sell primary sales, but instead just give as much value in creating this ecosystem in players as possible. And the monetization quite literally is taking 5% on every trade, taking 10%. And, and that's a totally different model than if you're doing that plus you're selling primary sales. And ultimately, we're building the platform. Our job is to make it possible for game developers to leverage royalties in order to create valuable long-term economies that they can have aligned incentives with. It's not to pick 
what we think the market will tolerate as acceptable royalties. And, you know, if they set them too high, and the market's like, I don't want to trade this stuff, I think that's completely fair. But the problem we've seen with Blur, with X2, Y2, is this race to the bottom, because you can skip royalties currently by a smart contracts on, you know, Ethan, because it's not enforceable at a, a sort of contract or protocol level, means that game developers won't even move in the first place. You know, Gabe Layden is incredibly vocal about this, who is the founder of Machine Zone, who spent more money on performance ads than pretty much any other game CEO in existence. I think it's essential that people can have enforceable protocol royalties in order for games companies to develop truly aligned business models uh, and also for even creators if they create a line and want to monetize through that to feel economic guarantee so it's a really valuable thing I'm, I'm very proud that we've been able to develop this solution on immutable zk EVM, where you can set a royalty and have it enforceable no matter where that asset trades